On the 28th of April, 1996, the historic tourist site of Port Arthur in Tasmania became the scene of the largest massacre ever to hit Australia. Aussie officials are calling it the worst massacre in over a hundred years. There was one body on the doorstep, obviously shot, blood pouring out of him. Within minutes, a gunman rampaged through the site, shooting at innocent people. I've not seen injuries like that. There is such destruction from this sort of weapon. The mother was carrying the three-year-old baby when they were both shot. The scale of the deaths and injuries that was to follow rocked the world. Those scenes were simply horrific. And I have an extraordinary amount of admiration for everybody that had to confront those scenes on the day. 35 people were shot and killed, and 23 wounded. I've never been involved in war, but I could think of nothing that would describe uh, an incident such as that inside this place as the product of war. I felt when I left Port Arthur that I had to do something. The devastation wreaked by the mass murderer and the colossal change the tragedy provoked makes this a crime that shook Australia. I was working, I started at nine that morning because there were, wasn't many staff on, it was a really busy day. The picturesque tourist site of Port Arthur sits on the Tasman Peninsula, an integral part of Australian history, ever since the British convicts were first shipped there in the 18th century. Back in those days, the equivalent of Guantanamo Bay, it was a military reserve. You weren't allowed on the peninsula unless you had business there. It was run by the soldiers and, and Governor Arthur. The historic site is relatively beautiful in the sense that much of it still survives. Some of it's been restored. So it has that interesting combinations of trees and um, plants that you would find in the United Kingdom that, of course, are not native in Tasmania. Port Arthur is always on the list of places to go with anybody that visits us. On the morning of the 28th of April, 1996, Ian Kingston along with 30 staff at Port Arthur, were preparing to welcome many tourists. There was a lot of the management side of the, of the organisation were at a seminar on the east coast of Tasmania, Bichonneau. And um, it's how come I ended up here on the day. It became obvious by about 11 that it was going to be more busier than what they predicted. I think we had 14 coaches end up coming in. Car parking was getting a bit of an issue because visitor centres there now wasn't there in those days. Everyone used to park under the oak trees and, you know, it was really limited. One of the tourists visiting the site that day was Peter Crosswell. At the time, I was the state manager of an organisation called Camp Quality. It was a support program for kids with cancer and their families. Peter's role that day was to look after other people visiting from the organisation. They chose a day out at Port Arthur. 
We had one team at that particular time that had developed the program that were based in Sydney, and they actually come over to Tasmania to do their first tour here. And it so happened that that weekend, they'd been here a week going around the primary schools, and they wanted to go down to Port Arthur. Um, so I took them down there for the day. Just three kilometres up the road from the tourist site, a local man, Martin Bryant, arrived at Seascape, a popular guest house run by David and Sally Martin. As people started to filter in to Port Arthur, Ian, one of the site's support staff, fielded the many vehicles packed with tourists. I was sort of coordinating parking around lunchtime when Martin Bryant drove in. Martin Bryant was a 28-year-old man from Newtown, Hobart. Like all the other tourists that day, Ian Kingston believed he was there to have a look around. Didn't recognise him. He'd been around in the area when he was a kid, growing up, and he was entirely different to what he used to be, like he'd grown up and matured. When he drove in on the day, he wanted to park down near the jetty, and um, I pointed out to him that he couldn't do that because there was already about eight coaches there. So he said, oh, can I park in front of the information centre? And uh, I said, well, it's better if you park along under the trees, under the oak trees. He wanted to get on the 130 ferry. And I said, well, you'll have to get a boarding pass from the information centre. He tried to get on the boat, couldn't get on. So he got back in the car and went and parked down in amongst all the coaches where we didn't want him to park anyway. I watched him do that. He uh, sat there for half a minute. He got out of his car. On the back seat of his car, he had a, like a golf bag type of thing, a big bag. And I saw that as he drove in. Anyway, he mucked around the back seat, got this bag out, put it on his shoulder. Anyway, I didn't really take a lot of notice of it. Then he went in the boot and he was mucking around in the boot of the car. That took him a couple of minutes, fiddling with there, doing whatever he had to do. Then he walked up to the cafe. The Broad Arrow Cafe was situated just up from the car park and the water's edge, across from the main penitentiary ruins. He went in the front door and uh, he was probably in there for a few minutes, it might have been 10, 15, something. As Ian continued to help other tourists, Bryant ate his meal on the deck and then went back inside. What was to happen next would change Australia forever. And all of a sudden, I hear this bang, bang, bang. I could see dust coming out of the building where, from where I was looking. And I thought, what's going on? I started to make my way up there. and still going. I thought, God, must be a bloody electrical fault. Anyway, I ran in the building, and as I went in the door, there was one body on the doorstep, obvious shot, blood pouring out of him. Tasmania's main tourist attraction, Port Arthur, is under siege. Ian Kingston, one of the staff members, has been helping tourists throughout the morning as the site gets busier. After hearing loud noises from the cafe, he rushes to investigate and could never have prepared for what he was confronted with. I got inside the building and there's Bryant standing with his gun. And um, beside him over a bit, he had his big bag that he had on his back. And I could see in the bag that there was some other gun of some description. Ian faced an unprecedented situation. Martin Bryant had opened fire with a semi-automatic weapon in the busy cafe. 
giving the innocent customers and staff little time to react. Peter Crosswell was also there with his party. You can't comprehend that you're sitting on this beautiful April day, it's quite cool, sitting down for a cup of coffee, and then somebody start, starts coming and shooting people. It, it doesn't make sense. The cafe and adjoining gift shop were crowded with more than 60 customers and staff when Bryant opened fire. It takes time to react to it. You can't think it through, you just react to it. And some people reacted by running, other people reacted by hiding cupboards. As the cold-blooded killer indiscriminately shot at anyone in his path, Peter made the split-second decision to try to shield his colleagues from the gunfire. I reacted in a different way. It's not a weakness, not strength. It's just the way you react, given that. And a lot of the people that were killed were older people. They didn't have the reaction time, and they were virtually shot where they were set. As Peter took cover and the gunman continued his rampage, Ian Kingston witnessed the horror from the doorway. There was a person to the left of me. They went to move and he turned around and shot the guy. And then while I was there, this chap behind him, he got up and moved his chair and he turned around and shot two more people then. And while he had his back to me, I got out. In the space of just 90 seconds, Martin Bryant had shot and killed 20 people, injuring a further 12. As Ian rushed away from the cafe to warn others and get them to safety, some tourists hadn't yet realized a killer was on the loose. By that time, we had a couple of touch loads of American tourists, and they thought it was just some sort of a show. And they were all flocking from out on the oval and all around the whole site to see what was going on. And, um, like, I was sort of didn't know what to do. With no signs of relenting, Bryant continued shooting in the cafe and gift shop. I got as many as I could together in the bunk, and um, we started to make our way up through Government Gardens, past the fountain, to the parsonage, That's where I was bringing them to, so it was pretty safe. As Ian desperately gathered as many people as he could to run to safety, the gunman started to move outside, where many unwitting tourists still had no idea what was happening. Here's the gunshots, live action here at uh, Port Arthur. I looked around and I saw him come out of the cafe, and he came out and he shot a couple of shots across the, over the oval towards the penitentiary. Tourists and staff tried to take cover as the cold-blooded killer headed back towards the car park. In just seconds, he took aim at people as they ran for their lives or hid for safety on the parked vehicles. Nobody was spared. Meanwhile, Ian Kingston could see the tragedy unfold as he battled to get his group to safety. We were bringing all these people up to the parsonage and we had the Mickax with us. She decided she didn't want to be part of our group, it was too dangerous. She was going to leave the side. Anyway, at that point I saw him come off the bus and I said to her, stay with us, he's getting in the car. No, she said, I'm going to run up the road. The Mickax were a young family. Nanette and her two girls, Madeline, age three, and Alana, six visiting the site that day. Despite Ian's desperate pleas, Nanette was frantic to get her children to safety and took the decision to try and escape alone. The Mickax, they wanted to go home and that was where we lost them. They just veered off and unfortunately went the wrong way. As the family ran out of Port Arthur, Bryant also made his way off the site. 
he had just shot at 11 innocent people in and around the car park and jetty. The carnage and devastation left many severely wounded and others dead. Got in the car, drove out, headed up out of the site. At the top of the site, there used to be a toll, the toll booth was there when everyone paid their money. He's about halfway up and he had, he started shooting off him. He's probably shot the kids and all that. Ian feared for the safety of the Mikax. Having made the decision to leave at the same time as Bryant, they were right in his path. The gunman drove up to the family, just a few hundred meters from the exit, and stopped beside them, shooting the mother dead, before turning the gun on Madeline and Alana. How dare someone murder two little kids after murdering their mother and chase one of them around a tree to kill her. It just beggars belief. of the massacre was now unparalleled. A lone killer had started a callous rampage with apparently no motive. Now more than 20 people lay dead and over a dozen wounded. And the nightmare didn't appear to be ending. On seeing the brutal killings of the Mikax, other tourists quickly hurried to get out of Bryant's path, warning anyone they could to turn back. By now, the gunman was already back in his car and making his way to the toll booth. At that point, I heard some more shooting at the top of the hill. You know, I rang the toll booth, Aileen was in there, and um, I told her, you know, lie on the floor. She said, all the money, we're counting the money. So, and I said, don't worry about the bloody money, just get down because he's coming back. So she just laid on the floor. Martin Bryant had, in fact, murdered four friends at their car pulling their bodies out of the vehicle and into the road before stealing it. The killer then drove to a local service station, targeting another car that was about to leave. The couple in the vehicle had no chance to escape. The female passenger was shot as she tried to flee, whilst the man was forced at gunpoint into the boot of the stolen car. Bryant now had a hostage. An unprecedented tragedy has happened at Port Arthur in Tasmania. A lone gunman has opened fire at the popular tourist attraction, shooting innocent visitors and staff. Dozens lie dead and severely injured as the killer continues his rampage out of the site and along the road at a service station. What happened was that after Bryant left and continued his shooting rampage up the road, you could still hear the, the gunshots. And the gunfire could be heard across the site as Ian rushed to get his group away from the danger. Near yeah, the parsonage would be about 300 metres from the cafe. On the left. It's the longest 300 metres ever I've walked in my whole life. It was a bit of an issue to get everyone up there as quickly as we could. As the afternoon went on, the whole phone network got clogged. It was hard, and it was hard trying to pacify visitors that were here that couldn't ring out. It was couldn't get a line, trying to tell people their families overseas, they're all OK. As the survivors waited for help, Bryant was still on the loose. After taking a hostage prisoner in the boot of his car, he drove to a place he had already been to that day. Seascape guest house. By now, emergency services had been alerted to the tragedy and were rushing to the numerous crime scenes unfolding. Terry McCarthy was a trained negotiator with Tasmania Police. The initial call I got was extraordinarily brief 
It said something along the lines of 20 dead at Port Arthur, get here now. My initial task was to try and make contact with Seascape to establish who was there and perhaps ascertain what was going on. Whilst officers were getting into position, news of the horror was filtering through to forensic psychiatrist Ian Sale. I heard vaguely this news flash about shootings. At least 200 police have surrounded Port Arthur. All roads in have been blocked. I thought, my, my heavens, this is happening here. I knew because I'd done occasional call-outs with the police negotiator squad. I got a telephone call from uh, uh, a police officer I know to ask if I could come in and lend a hand. Information was now trickling through to Terry and Ian about the enormity of the killer's rampage. At this point, they had no idea of what to expect from this gunman. He had already callously murdered dozens of people and showed no signs of stopping. He talked about a vehicle that was burning uh, on the property and sort of kept asking, why aren't we, aren't we doing anything about it? And it was like he'd set that fire to force police to come in to investigate what was going on. And of course, he'd set himself up to, to um, ambush those police officers should they go in there. With a burning vehicle in front of the building, Terry had to be mindful not to rush in and put officers' lives in danger. The police also faced another challenge. Two of my colleagues were stuck in a ditch across the road and under fire, and um, part of my role, of course, was to keep Brian occupied, engaged in, in conversation, so that some sort of um, action could be taken to perhaps get those guys out. The trapped officers had been the first on the scene at the guest house. Unaware of the scale of the danger, they had to take cover as he shot at them from inside the house. It was difficult to work out exactly what, uh, what, what weapons Bryant had. But certainly the vehicle that he travelled down to the historic site was subsequently located and um, it was established that there were a number of weapons uh, still in the, in the boot of that vehicle along with a significant quantity of ammunition. So we knew he had access to high-powered, high-capacity magazine firearms, but as to where they came from, we, we weren't sure at that particular stage. He was able to fire significant numbers of rounds in the general direction of police officers on the ground. As Terry tried to get any information from Bryant, investigations were underway to try and find out who this gunman was and what possible motive he could have to cause such heartache. Well, I'd never heard of Bryant uh, before the day. And uh, on the day, the information we got in, they were able to eventually identify who he was. And then they were able to identify family members but the information that family members gave us was, was confusing. We were initially told that uh, Bryant had schizophrenia, um, but the conversations that he was having uh, with the police certainly didn't suggest schizophrenia, and um, it's not the sort of incident you would expect a person with schizophrenia to uh, cause. Um, but nonetheless, we were faced with that sort of information and trying to make sense of that. With limited information on this volatile character, the police were desperate to get answers from Bryant and to try and stop any further bloodshed. But Terry McCarthy didn't receive the response he anticipated. You're expecting a structured conversation and a belief by the other, the other person that they have some, some goal that they want to achieve. Whereas we just seem to be going through motions. It was clear that Martin Bryant really didn't have a plan. And as a consequence of that, the negotiations didn't develop in the, in, in the direction that one would expect them to develop. So our focus became to establish whether there was anybody in the stronghold with him and to convince him to surrender himself without um, any further harm. 
As the siege at the guest house appeared to be at stalemate, the hours since the initial shootings were passing by, and news of the mass killings was now spreading as medical teams desperately battled to save the victims. It was about half past two or three in the afternoon, and uh, my wife told me that um, the switchboard at the Royal had rung and that there was a major disaster. Steve Wilkinson was head of surgical specialties at the Royal Hobart Hospital at the time. We knew that at that stage there were going to be multiple casualties, so we formed uh, small trauma teams. We had to clear out an entire ward uh, of patients that were already there. We had to either send them home or move them out to other wards. We didn't know how many people were coming in. It could have been 10 or it could have been 100. We just didn't know. With the hospital on red alert, casualties soon started arriving with varying degrees of wounds. Peter Crosswell, who had shielded his colleagues in the cafe, was taken in to be treated. There were a couple of us, like myself and my two working mates, uh, who got fragments of bullets and you know, all that type of stuff. In trying to save his friends and dodge the gunfire, Peter was shot. The place was so somber as you can imagine. Uh, it, was, it was like being in a morgue in the hospital. It was shocking. But not many people stayed there for very long. I think there was uh, two or three of us in there for four or five days. As Peter was treated, Steve Wilkinson and his team were trying to establish the scale of everyone's wounds. I've got to say that I've not seen injuries like that. You know, a lot of, we see gunshots and stabbings from time to time, but there is such destruction from this sort of weapon that, uh, you know, there's just loss of tissue. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, major sort of surgery required. Meanwhile, 95 kilometres away at Seascape Guesthouse, the negotiation team was trying to establish if Bryant had injured anyone else inside. David and Sally Martin, the two owners, hadn't been seen for hours. During those limited communications, we heard no sounds of life other than, than Bryant. And it's one of the reasons you have these negotiations, you're trying to work out what else is going on. Uh, in, the, in their environment. Bryant mentioned how he was preparing food for hostages, but the negotiators couldn't determine whether he was bluffing or telling the truth. And other information he was providing just didn't add up. The way he spoke was more like a young teenager rather than an adult male. He was telling us stuff that was completely false. He said he'd been out surfing or something like that, and it was complete nonsense. So there wasn't anything uh, useful happening in that communication. We didn't establish that rapport um, because there was no rapport to establish. He was in denial as to what had occurred in terms of he wasn't even making reference to what had occurred at the historic site. He was talking about some fanciful event that he claimed had occurred at um, uh, another location at Fortescue Bay, which is also on the, on the peninsula. It was like a, a bad script that he was operating on. And the situation was about to get worse. What we weren't aware of at that particular time was that the only phone within the Seascape property was a battery-operated cordless phone. We were aware that he was using that phone, but we, had, we didn't have the knowledge that there wasn't a backup landline phone that he could pick up in the event that that went flat. So that created, us, uh, it created some problems for us when, of course, it, it, it was apparent that the battery had gone flat. The difficulty, of course, is how do you get a telephone into a situation like that safely? After hours of attempts to get some breakthrough with Bryant, the telephone line had gone flat. They were no closer to a peaceful resolution and had no idea if the hostages were safe. 
when the communications broke down, uh, it was decided that the negotiator unit would move down to a place called Turana, which is about uh, five or six kilometres north of uh, Seascape. And they set up a, a operations area there and various attempts were made to try and get the communication going again with Bryant, but they were all unsuccessful. They, they, they weren't able to find a way. As daylight broke the following morning, the killer had been holed up in the guest house for 18 hours. What happened next was to stun the officers as Bryant made his next move. The next morning, um, he decided to set fire to the property. Port Arthur in Tasmania has just experienced one of the worst human atrocities in Australian criminal history. A lone gunman, Martin Bryant, has walked into a tourist attraction with a semi-automatic gun and shot at innocent people. In an attack lasting 15 minutes, over 30 victims have been killed and dozens injured. More than 18 hours on from the tragedy, the killer is still hiding in a guest house nearby with possible hostages. Negotiators have lost communication after the phone line went flat. And whilst they try to re-establish connection, Bryant changes tack once more. He'd set fire to Seascape and then was eventually forced out by the fire. I'm not sure why he did that. I suspect he was trying to have police take some action. That didn't occur, of course, and as a result, he, I think he found it a bit difficult inside, perhaps getting himself burnt. He was arrested a short period of time later um, when he escaped from the house. With Seascape in flames, emergency services rushed to the aid of any hostages that might have been inside, whilst Bryant was taken to hospital. I personally was keeping an eye on the news and uh, we saw that the uh, house that he was holed up in went up in flames and that he'd been captured and so we knew he was coming. We wound up the burns unit to receive him and uh, he was brought in under pretty tight security. We gave the medical and nursing staff the option of treating him or not being involved in his treatment. He had quite significant burns, and um, that took a while to sort those out. Back at the guest house, officials battling the blaze were to encounter more devastation, as three bodies were discovered. One victim was Glenn Pears, the man he had taken hostage at the service station. The others were David and Sally Martin, the owners of Seascape. He broke off communication at one stage and said he was going to prepare food for the, the hostages. Um, but I suspect, uh, in retrospect, that the hostages were, were dead by then. Officers were to also discover that Bryant's rampage had begun before arriving at Port Arthur. Visiting Seascape on the morning of the tragedy and killing the Martins. But why had he singled those out? I believe he held a grudge against the people who ran the b and and that's probably where it started, that grudge. I, I suspect that he held them in part responsible for his father's death. The death of his father is probably the central matter. His father committed suicide in a farm dam and the family say that he was distressed by this. I believe that he suspected that his father died because of a dispute with the people who owned Seascape. I think that's probably the heart of what, what happened and it started off as revenge towards them. Martin Bryant's father, Morris, had previously tried to buy the guest house. Yet the Martins secured it first, allegedly creating stress for the Bryant family. But if this was the catalyst in sending the gunman over the edge, why did he target all the other innocent victims too? 
I think that what happened then at Broad Arrow, he expected to be stopped. He thought, just like Hollywood, that there'd be some hero with a gun there who'd cut him down. But it didn't happen. There was no one there. So this was an incident that once it got that far, he wasn't able to stop. It, was, uh, it wasn't scripted for him. And uh, it, I, I just think it sort of got there by accident. He didn't know what to do and just kept on going. As Bryant was treated for his burns, Ian Sale and colleagues tried to dig deeper into his background for any insight. They were able to uh, retrieve his hospital record and uh, we learned from that that he'd recently uh, been in hospital for quite a serious injury in a motor vehicle accident and they had noticed some oddness about his behaviour but had been assured by family that he's got schizophrenia. We also went to the house in Newtown where he'd been living but that was confusing too. He'd been living there with this um, rather eccentric woman and the house was certainly eccentric. She was a hoarder and a collector and that showed in the house. It was a very, very weird house, to be honest. The woman who Bryant had lived with was Helen Harvey, a friend who had died in the car accident that injured Bryant four years before. Her death resulted in him inheriting a substantial amount of money. For various reasons, he'd come into a lot of money he was unrestrained. The people who had some degree of control over him, his father, Mrs Harvey, with whom he lived, they were both dead. It was mayhem because he could do whatever he liked. And he did. Bryant had, in fact, inherited an estate worth millions of dollars. But this didn't answer the questions now being raised on how he managed to get hold of the guns in the first place. As far as I'm aware, Bryant bought one of his weapons through a classified ad. Another one he bought from a, a dealer who uh, had a shop about two blocks away. No one knew that he had these weapons. Bryant had bought an array of semi-automatic weapons with ease, no questions asked. He held no license or authorization for them. His trail of devastation had ended the lives of 35 people and caused horrific injuries to 23 victims. The number of people left affected by his crime would be too high to count. Days after the mass shooting, the country was trying to come to terms with their loss. It shocked the nation, it shocked the world, but it really shocked Tasmania. And, you know, people were just numb, I think, for, for days, weeks and months after it. I got a message from John Major, the British Prime Minister. He recalled that the massacre in Dunblane in Scotland had claimed 27 lives, and John said he never imagined that within a few weeks the number killed there would be exceeded in Australia. It was a, a tragedy that, as the days went by, it unnerved the country. No, nobody could believe that something of this magnitude had happened in Australia. Uh, and these are the sort of things that happen in other countries, they don't happen in Australia. What Port Arthur did was to bring home the fact that there were um, gaps in the gun laws. The Prime Minister at the time, John Howard, made quick, decisive actions to alter the legislation that was in place on guns. The magnitude of the tragedy in Port Arthur provided the momentum or change to occur. The law as it stood meant automatic and semi-automatic weapons were readily available and legal to citizens across Australia, with certain laws on licensing and ownership in place. I looked at that character and I suppose I had to think, why was it so easy for you to harm so many people? relatively insignificant character, simple-minded, but just had access to weapons that allowed him to do a heck of a lot of damage in a very short period of time. The laws were reasonably strict, but obviously they weren't strict enough.
by the following month, the government had made the biggest change in their weapons policy to date, bringing in the National Firearms Agreement. The agreement was that we'd have a nationwide ban on automatic and semi-automatic weapons, and we'd have strict rules about uh, how you looked after the guns that you're entitled to have. And then we said, well, to make it work, we've got to have a buyback. And that was part of it. And uh, I said that the federal government would fund the buyback. Now, we bought back 750,000 guns. I take my hat off to John Howard for doing what he did, for having the guts to stand up to the gun lobby. And as far as I'm concerned now, it ought to be a hell of a lot tougher to own a gun. The, the timing was certainly right um, after Port Arthur. And it was the right, right thing to do. The, the way they approached it, and they gained a huge amount of support for it. So it has been successful. We've had since that legislation, if you define a mass murder or homicide as more than five killed in the same incident, we've not had any since then. As people tried to rebuild their lives and readjust to the new gun laws, the fate of the man who wrecked so many lives was being sealed. He wasn't mentally ill in the usual sense. He um, was fit to stand trial. He understood that he was charged and, and uh, with 35 counts of murder and sundry other things. Uh, at that stage, when I met him, interviewed him at the, uh, the prison, he was still denying his involvement. We wanted to ensure that the police case or the Crown's case was so, so compelling and without flaw that we could successfully convict this individual for every murder that he committed. He didn't change his mind until basically right at the end of the trial. He uh, suddenly uh, decided to plead guilty. Martin Bryant's plea of guilty was accepted for all of the charges and the Supreme Court of the day um, ordered 35 life sentences and his papers were marked never to be released. Martin Bryant was remanded in Risdon Prison, Tasmania, where he will spend the rest of his days. But despite the heartache caused, some people were intent on questioning whether he was the actual killer. A lot of people came in afterwards, and a, a few of those people, for whatever motivation, uh, came up with a different story. They reckon, oh, there was two gunmen, and Bright and Brian didn't do it, and the government set him up, and oh, all this crap that was put out. It's all a load of bullshit, because it was nothing like that, and I was here, I was in the middle of it, and I know exactly what happened. Um, and I don't know where these stories originate, and how they get going, um, it's just a load of rubbish, you know. A poignant memorial now stands at the site where the Broad Arrow Cafe once was. A fitting tribute to all those affected by the tragedy on the 28th of April, 1996. The memorial garden's designed for people to go there, reflect, think about things, spend their own bit of time. The, the, the Bryant massacre just adds another layer to Port Arthur. It's horrible, it's awful, but it's not something to keep people away. I can't help but think the best way to remember it is to um, recall the fact that out of this terrible tragedy, the country moved forward in gun control and you can't remember the good without remembering the tragedy. These things are part of our history and there's no point in trying to airbrush them. The Peter Crossel now is no longer the Peter Crossel 15 seconds before Bryant started shooting. He's a totally different person and he is a better person. And I convinced myself that that was the case. So I move forward in life with Port Arthur Massacre 
embellished it in here and in here. <laughs> End of story. We can't just bury it, pretend it didn't happen, it didn't exist. I th and those people deserve more. The victims deserve more, the survivors deserve more, the families deserve more. It is part of Australian history and I think we need to treat it as such.